Good afternoon, Rotarians and guests. Hope everybody had a great weekend. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Toledo's virtual meeting featuring Rotarian Bert Logan of the Ohio History Connection. Before today's reflection and pledge, I want to acknowledge TPS officer Brandon Stalker, who was killed in the line of duty this past week. We are all very sorry to learn of his tragic loss to his family and to our community. <clears throat> Toledo Rotary supports law enforcement and first responders via the four-way test, which is used as our compass. Our club also has a long-standing tradition of offering our deepest condolences while acknowledging the ongoing efforts of our Peace Committee. So now I'll invite Mike George to deliver the reflection, Luke King to lead us as we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and past President George Eistetter to lead us in repeating the four-way test. Alex, it does not appear that uh, Mike is on the meeting. Well, how about if we have uh, Gary Murphy uh, lead us in the reflection? All right, thanks, Alex. Um, bow our heads, please. Dear God, let us be thankful for all the gifts that we have in this beautiful city of Toledo. And may we bless the family of a fallen comrade doing his duty to protect the citizens of Toledo. God bless us and America as our new president and vice president take their role in running our great nation. Wish them the best and good luck. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First, is it the truth? Is it the truth? And everybody repeats it after me. Second, is it fair to all concerned? Is it fair, is it to, fair all to all concerned? Concern? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Goodwill and better friendships. And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you very much, Rotary. Thank you, uh, Gary, Luke, and George. January's meeting sponsor is Brightview Health and Toledo Rotarian, Gene Dries. Thank you, Gene. Uh, I have a few updates um, that I just wanna go over here. So with the rollout of the COVID vaccine and changes that it'll bring about, I've asked the COVID task force to reconvene and revisit the parameters for the club regarding meeting in person. I also wanted to mention there are several there are several features in the spoke in last Thursday's spoke, so I just wanted to highlight a couple of them. On page five, we featured an update on the community's V project and our club's ad hoc committee's participation in this initiative. The spoke will include a regular update on any progress of the V project. I hope you saw, and it's on the screen now, the picture of Dr. Riyash Shadri receiving his COVID vaccine. It looks like he's wincing a little bit. If you do receive your vaccine, please send us a selfie to info at toledorotary.org as we support this ongoing effort of the V Project. Also, congratulations to Kate Fineski on a recent promotion to Senior Director of Institutional Advancement with the Great Lakes Museum. Check out the write-up in the spoke. Congrats, Kate. As a final thought to my updates, I focus and encourage 
members to join committees throughout the year and really get involved. Our service committees are completing their second round of grant vetting, and I'd like to invite any member to join us for the upcoming field advisory or FAC meeting. The meeting is on February 12th at 9 a.m. You're just gonna attend the meeting to witness one of our most active committees and you'll have a front row seat in understanding how your donations to our foundations are approved and distributed to those in need. If you are interested in attending, please send a quick email to info at rotary, toledorotary.org and the Zoom link will be sent to you. And now I'll invite past president Chuck Stocking to introduce a new member. Chuck. Thank you, President Alex. I thought in honor of this, I would wear a necktie. Probably most of you have forgotten what a necktie is, but I'm wearing the Rotary International necktie because this club is one of the great Rotary clubs of the world. And uh, it's a great opportunity to also introduce it to Rodney Eason, who is the individual I'm introducing. Rodney's an awesome guy, I want you to know, and, and I hope that we will all be able to get together again soon so that you can get acquainted with him. But let me tell you a little bit about his background. He's born and raised in Toledo and has uh, a, a strong academic background. Uh, went to the University of Cincinnati, receiving a bachelor's degree in marketing and management, and later received a ma master's uh, of business administration from Heidelberg University. He's a certified as a senior professional in human resources and a Society of Human Resource Management senior certified professional. There's a whole lot of uh, letters behind his name, which is pretty awesome. You know, I don't think he gives vaccination shots, but everything else in between here and there, you know, probably. So uh, he currently serves as vice president of our company at Principal Business, uh, and he's vice president of human resources. Prior to coming to PBE, he was he had experience as operations manager at UPS, uh, human, regional human resource manager for Fifth Third Bank, and most recently, human resource director for the plant nutrient group at the Andersons. And Fran, I apologize. Rodney's a really great guy, and he has nothing but good to say about the Andersons. It's a, he's awesome, and so is the Andersons. So we love them, love them both. Um, I would say this about Rodney that uh, he is very active in community uh, community uh, uh, organizations that are making a difference and it's so great to have him part of Toledo Rotary. As an example, he serves on the Toledo Library Legacy Foundation Board, Toledo Museum of Art Board, the Prometica Metro Hospital Board, and is a member of the Society of Human Resource Management. Uh, I would also indicate that he's, uh, he's uh, a loving husband and very active. One of his great hobbies and, and things he enjoys doing is spending time with his wife, Sheila, and the two children, Donovan and Nia. So I, I really press Rodney on, on his uh, pet peeves. And so here's, this should be a pretty good indicator of the kind of guy he is. Is it anything or anyone or any structure that devalues people? Isn't that exactly what we want in the fellowship of Toledo Rotary? So it's my great now, I, know I would say one more thing about him. He taught me the value of an important word that I think we all need to get into our head, and that is cadence. Uh, you, you get a rhythm of what you do in your life and in, in HR work, and it's been so instructional because sometimes we just pulled out and do stuff, but Rodney has brought that sense of grace to our company, and I know he'll bring that to Toledo Rotary and everything he does in the Toledo community. So. Join me in giving a warm Rotary welcome to Toledo Rotary. Welcome to Rodney Eason. I guess, is this a space to say a couple things, Chuck, or do I just kind of move, do we just kind of move on? I don't know, take it if you can. <laughs> Well, first of all, uh, it's good to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, if I had the time, I'd come and say hi to each of you. I will should us, should do a special shout out to Fran. I can't help but doing that because of, yeah, it's, it's nice to see your face again, Fran. Um, but thank you, everybody. Thank you for allowing me. Uh, I think this is a privilege and not necessarily uh, a given. So I'm, I'm really happy to serve. 
um, and, and, and interact with some of you who are familiar faces, but those of you who may not be familiar faces. Um, and, I, and I also just say thank you to Chuck for your support. Um, one of the things I loved in all the places that I've worked is the community service aspect of what we do. So Chuck, thank you for your support and I'm looking forward to getting to know uh, many of you as well as working alongside with you to help build this community. So thank you. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Toledo, Rodney. You have just joined one of the largest clubs worldwide in an organization with over 1.2 million members. I look forward to seeing you in action as you engage with our members and the club. And now I'd like to turn the program over to Executive Director Kathy Tate to talk to you about a new initiative within our club. Kathy? Wow, thank you, President Alex. Turning it over to me is a pretty strong uh, statement, but I'll take it as well. So I wanted to share with all of you uh, as fellow Rotarians and many of you friends, um, uh, a couple, one of my greatest privileges. And, uh, and so I wanna reference the spoke that went out on Thursday and on page three, um, and, and you don't need to go back and look at it, but there's a new initiative <clears throat> that's going to be a regular part of the spoke called In Their Own Words. And this came about and I took it to the board because of the privilege that I feel that I have to work with uh, president. And now I, uh, I think I am uh, working alongside my ninth president as your executive director. And I was working with past president Walt McGee when, um, when I had this thought that I wanted to do, which was just to, uh, he, Walt McGee and so many other past presidents continue to do so much in our club. And while they're presidents, uh, and this is just something I feel like I know, um, they do a tremendous amount of service. And I appreciate it so much. And I just wanted to share a little bit with uh, you on that. So I uh, mentioned at the board, they approved it. Uh, then um, uh, Rotarian uh, Kevin Mullen offered to help. I was just going to put some Q and A and the spoke, and he said, "Why don't we do it on video?" Which is just takes it to a new level. So I want to share with you a short snippet of the video, uh, which Travis will play in just a second, and then reference you to check out the spoke this week. It's a full ten minute video, so it's too long to play in a Monday meeting, but it is spectacular, and it will give all of you insight into who our past presidents were when they served. There's 25 that remain in our club; they're still active. And, uh, and you'll get to know them better. And, and I, for me, it's a privilege and, and I think it's an honor and I want you to uh, be familiar with a little bit of their service. So thank you. Travis, go ahead and play that short snip. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, learned a lot about Rotary in that year and I, I guess by the time I got to the end of the year, I probably would have made a heck of a good president. I think uh, uh, being of service is, is an important uh, phrase that um, it's been a major part of my life, being of service. Um, so I was spent uh, 40 years in uh, commercial and public broadcasting and uh, really enjoyed it. I had a call from uh, Chuck Mann, uh, who said uh, we need to we need to put together a list of people who uh, we can put up as as uh, as president for the uh, coming years, and could we include your name on it? And I said, no, no, no. I'm I'm just a little small guy out here. Uh, I'm not you know I'm not a major industrialist. You don't want to put me on there. Well, we need we need to put put some people's names on there. And would you would you just let us do that? And I said, uh, provided that that uh, you can guarantee to me that I won't be selected. And he said, well, you know, you can't guarantee anything, but uh, I do appreciate it. And if you could do that, I that would be great. And the next phone call was, guess what? You've been elected. So that's how I became president. Greatest challenge during my presidency was finding the time to do everything I wanted to do. It uh, wasn't necessarily what I had to do, but what I wanted to do. Um, 
I found that it was the greatest stretch uh, in terms of learning, in terms of new knowledge, uh, getting to know people I had not known before. Um, it was just having the time to do it. Get to know everybody you can in the club. Form, form a friendship with as many folks as you can and realize the more involved you are in the club, the more you take home. Kathy, that, that is just fantastic. That's a great idea. Love it. Um, I think many of our members will just love it. Love being able to, to hear the, the past presidents over the years. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. For that. Um, okay, so and finally, I'll invite uh, Rotarian Don Yerkes to introduce today's speaker, Rotarian Bert Logan of the Ohio History Connection. Don? I first became acquainted with the Ohio Historical Society, now known as the Ohio History Connection, in the mid-1980s. As I traveled from my home in Pittsburgh to a family gathering in North Central Indiana, I had the opportunity to visit the Zane Gray National Road Museum in Norwich, Ohio. I was so impressed with the museum and what I learned about the entire organization that I told my wife, if I ever move to Ohio, I am going to become a member. Fast forward to 1992. I became a member of the Ohio Historical Society. I have been a member ever since. Fast forward again to 2009. I had recently been appointed to the Ohio Historical Society Development Board. OHS was in the throes of the Great Recession, cutting hours, services, and staff. We had just experienced the sudden death of our current executive director. This is when Bert Logan came to Ohio. Bert has been instrumental in revitalizing this organization, changing its name to the Ohio History Connection, focusing more on programs for younger people, partnering with statewide and local organizations to better manage the organization's widely di dispersed sites and develop more awareness of Ohio's rich heritage, working to update and improve exhibits both at the Columbus History Center and elsewhere, and establishing programs to help assure long-term organizational financial stability. Prior to coming to Ohio, Bert graduated from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and served five years in the Army. He received a Master of Arts degree in History Museum Studies from Cooperstown Graduate Program in Cooperstown, New York. For you that are geographically challenged, Cooperstown is also the home of the Baseball Hall of Fame, one of my all-time favorite sites to visit. He served as the director of the Wisconsin Maritime Museum in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. This museum is a great place to visit, has a World War II submarine similar to the submarines that were actually built in Manitowoc and floated down the Mississippi River for ocean service. He also served as the executive director and then president of the USS Constitution Museum in Boston, Massachusetts. This is another great museum to visit honoring Old Ironsides, the oldest commissioned United States warship. The museum has many hands-on exhibits to better understand what it was to be a sailor in the Navy during the early 19th century. Additionally, Bert was a Rotarian during his time in Manitowoc. He is also a Paul Harris Fellow. I had the privilege of briefly working with Bert in his Ohio History Connection efforts. I think he is a thoughtful and dynamic leader. Ladies and gentlemen of Toledo Rotary, 
Bert Logan. Thank you very much, Don, for that introduction. And thank you all for the invitation to speak. And thank you for being a member for so many years. Um, it's gratifying to see how uh, your first visit to Zen Gray Museum has really uh, blossomed over the years uh, as your involvement with the Ohio History Connection has deepened. Uh, also, I'd like to give a shout out to Bob Lucas. I don't know if Bob's on the call today, uh, but Bob is a former president of our board. Uh, Bob served two or three years as president, uh, remains on the board, and is certainly, uh, like Don, a very steadfast supporter of Ohio history and the Ohio history connection. Um, what I'd like to do this afternoon uh, is to share with you just a bit about our statewide service. And Don mentioned the change in our name from Ohio Historical Society to Ohio History Connection. And we think that that word connection really brings to bear what we are about. And we're about connecting as many Ohioans as we can with the story of the state and helping them to understand better uh, not only their past, but uh, how we can move forward. Uh, joining me momentarily will be a colleague, Megan Wood, that I'll introduce, and she'll do a bit of a deeper dive uh, into our historic sites and also into an exciting uh, project for a World Heritage nomination. But for the moment, let me begin a screen share and um, start by saying that the Ohio History Connection, uh, we're not a state agency per se. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that has been in existence since 1885, but we work very closely with the state of Ohio. And in essence, we really fulfill the state's history uh, responsibilities. And I'm going to, you know, the old saying of a mile wide and, and an inch deep, I just want to touch on several ways in which we reach out across Ohio and then allow Megan to do uh, that uh, deeper uh, look into our historic sites um, and our World Heritage nomination. So, most of you are probably familiar with our headquarters building, the Ohio History Center uh, in Columbus. Uh, it's located right by the state fairgrounds on Interstate 71. And I think sometimes people have the perception that this is really the Ohio History Connection, but it's our headquarters building. It also is the State Museum. Um, and if you could go up to the very top floor of this five-story building, you would find the state archives. Uh, this is one of the many stacks within the archives, and it contains, um, you can probably think of it as truckloads of semi uh, trucks full of records for the state uh, going back to 1803. Uh, included in that are naturalization records, soldier discharge records, deeds, uh, tax duplicates. But the State Archives also works with local government. So we provide a number of webinars and training sessions uh, throughout the year uh, to help county, township, uh, whatever level of local government it might be to manage their records that are so important uh, for uh, the preservation of the, the local history uh, in each of our communities. Uh, these folks are smiling because as you can see, they've each received a big check from the Ohio History Fund. Uh, this photograph is taken uh, as it's been done for a number of years at Statehood Day uh, down at the State House in the atrium. And the Ohio History Fund is unique among the many responsibilities that we discharge around the state in that these are not appropriated funds that come to us from the General Assembly and from the state's operating budget, but rather they're funds that Ohioans have contributed to the History Fund through the income tax checkoff or through buying uh, Ohio History a license plate. And we're now in our ninth or 10th year of the Ohio History Fund and I'd like to share with you just a couple of projects that we have been able to fund in Northwest Ohio. Uh, first, at the Libby House a couple of years ago, uh, we made a grant of $15,727 that provided uh, the first uh, opportunity for accessible restroom. Uh, it also provided for a ramp 
uh, behind the building so that the home would be totally uh, accessible. We also funded a project at uh, Bowling Green uh, State University. Uh, back in 2002 to 2004, uh, they offered a course called the History of World War II. And there were 108 oral histories that the students collected during that time, uh, but they were all in uh, paper form and in recording form. And this particular grant uh, in the amount of $6,000 enabled this extensive collection of World War II oral histories uh, from residents of Northwest Ohio uh, to be digitized. So they've been preserved in digital form and they're now accessible uh, really across not only the state but around the world. We also have made a grant to the Wood County Museum. Uh, they received a $4,000 grant to help improve their collection storage. And if time permitted, I could share many other ways in which the History Fund has helped not only in Northwest Ohio, but throughout the state. So as you uh, complete your state income tax return uh, in the coming days, uh, if you have a refund coming your way, uh, please consider donating a portion of it uh, to the Ohio History Fund. It's one of the checkoff boxes that you'll find or we can uh, also accept uh, direct donations for the fund itself. Another way in which we are active around the state and in Northwest Ohio is through the State Historic Preservation Tax Credit Program. Um, projects can automatically qualify if they're on the National Register for a federal tax credit. But in addition, they can qualify if they meet certain criteria for a state tax credit. And this can amount to up to 45% of the total construction or renovation cost uh, of a project. And I think this is a particular uh, good example of how at the local level, we're helping to preserve the built environment, those buildings that play a, uh, an important role in the community or in the state. Uh, the Elijah Pelton Jones House, uh, this was a smaller project in terms of uh, a $230,000 project. But the uh, impact, and you can begin to see some of the great work that was done. Uh, the photograph at the top is the uh, plaster work, and you can see the bottom, how it has turned out so well. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't get my uh, computer to <laughs> cooperate, but if you look at the top photograph, that's the fireplace. And if you tilt your head slightly, you can see how the fireplace looks after uh, the restoration project. This was owned by an individual and he has turned it into a small conference, a wedding and party center. And he would have been unable to do this particular project without a state tax credit. And I think everyone's certainly familiar with the Burden building in uh, the Burden building in Toledo. Uh, it was built in 1902 uh, down in the warehouse district, but it became empty in the 1980s and set vacant for nearly 30 years. But uh, about four or five years ago, there was a $32 million project undertaken. And again, 45% of that $32 million was provided through tax credits. So you can see how important and how uh, essential tax credit projects are to help restore uh, many of these buildings and contribute to the local economy. Uh, this project received one of our State Historic Preservation Awards uh, that we give annually. Another way that we help promote local history is through our marker program. And I just have several here to uh, share. This is uh, from uh, Henry County. We dedicated this marker uh, a couple years back uh, for the Miami Erie Canal and also for Napoleon's First Cemetery. Uh, this is a picture from Putnam County when we were dedicating a marker that you can see uh, sort of in the mid foreground uh, back in the summer of 2019 for the uh, Bryden Ball One Room Schoolhouse. And in Williams County, uh, there's a marker to William James Knight, who was one of Andrews Raiders, one of the first recipients of the Medal of Honor uh, on their daring uh, raid to uh, uh, recover uh, the stolen locomotive uh, that was so pivotal in the Civil War. And we have over 1,700 local markers around the state. 
Uh, and these are just representative examples from Northwest Ohio, how we really want to help uh, preserve and draw attention to uh, the local history uh, of each community. Ohio History Day, if you're familiar with uh, the science fair concept that students uh, in school undertake, History Day is simply a variation of that where students will prepare uh, a project. It can be an exhibit as shown here on the left. Uh, they're given a theme each year and it's up to them to conduct the research. Uh, it can be a local topic, a national topic, or uh, an international world um, theme. But through this, and you can see that this is uh, talking about conflict, and you can also see students are so excited. Uh, and to participate in History Day, uh, you can see the ones that are wearing ribbons uh, around their neck, uh, the two uh, young women. Um, represent those who have received a state award and will be going on to national competition. So if we had more time, I would love to delve more deeply into the ways in which we are helping to maintain and preserve history, not only in Northwest Ohio, but throughout the state. But what I'd like to do now is to yield to my colleague, Megan Wood, uh, Megan is director of the Cultural Resources Division at the Ohio History Connection. And our Cultural Resource Division is responsible for our 58 sites that she'll be giving us an overview of momentarily. Uh, the State Archives is under Megan's uh, purview as well as more than 1.8 million objects and our exhibitions uh, at all the sites. Uh, Megan has a BA in Public History from Western Michigan University. Uh, she also, uh, I'm proud to say, is a Cooperstown Graduate Program uh, alum. I think at one point the Ohio History Connection had so many Cooperstown uh, graduates that we were referred to as Cooperstown West. Um, but throughout her career, Megan has focused on education and learning in museums uh, and has taken a leadership role at the state uh, and local level, uh, national level. Uh, she's on the uh, Centennial Commission for Women's Suffrage, played an important role there. Uh, she's on the Education Committee for the American Alliance of Museums, and uh, just a sample of her leadership, uh, not only within the organization, but um, across uh, the profession. So with that, Megan, I will uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, Bert. Um, and I'm so glad to be here with the uh, Toledo Rotary. Um, I just have to say, I grew up in Michigan, which can be a dirty word in Columbus. So I used to sometimes say that I was from north of Toledo. Um, I thought you guys would enjoy that uh, as a reference to our friends to the north. I'm just gonna um, get my screen share here. Going. Um, so I'm gonna talk about our historic site system and uh, focus in a little bit on uh, sites in Northwest Ohio and talk about our world heritage efforts and, um, you know, share a little bit about how, you know, you can support the work that we're doing across the state, the really the heart, the heartbeat of everything that we do are these wonderful places all through the state of Ohio. These are just some stats um, about our site system. It's fairly expansive. It's really one of the biggest site networks of any state, um, state historical organization. So our sites um, range from the Ice Age, uh, the you know, the beginning of before there was human habitation in this place we now call Ohio, um, to the uh, American Indian history in Ohio, to our industrial and artistic history, um, African American history, um, the history of religious separatist groups in Ohio, and um, many, many more, many very beautiful places to visit. And there are 12 museums that cover topics ra ranging from ancient American history to African American history and also through um, space travel and beyond. Our list, um, I was going to focus in a little bit more on our Northwest Ohio sites, um, this corner of the state. Uh, so that you can learn a little bit more about what is within, you know, pretty quick drive. Uh, from Toledo. The Cook Dorn House um, is in Sandusky, 
Ohio, and it is named after both the um, a politician and lawyer um, Cook in Sandusky, but then later the Dorn family, and it became um, part of our site system. And the house looks as it did in the 1950s. So it's an interesting mix of history. Um, like all of our sites, uh, Cook Dorn House is managed cooperatively with a local site management partner. Um, and Cook Dorn is managed by the Old House Guild of Sandusky. On Kelly's Island, you can visit both glacial grooves and inscription rock. And I think everybody who goes to Kelly's Island um, gets to see glacial grooves. Um, which represent uh, the, the Ice Age history in Ohio, but also American Indian history in Ohio. And um, Ohio Department of Natural Resources is our partner um, on Kelly's Island. The Hayes uh, Presidential, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes Presidential Library and Museums um, is our site, uh, Spiegel Group and um, Fremont, where you can visit the museum and learn about the president. Um, do research at the library or visit the restored home. Um, and the Hayes has been a site of ours in partnership with their board um, since, since the site was founded. And it's also just a lovely piece of land um, and the outdoor experience at Spiegel Group is also really a beautiful experience as well. Um, very close here, um, Fort Meggs, uh, War of 1812, um, fort that's been reconstructed and our partner there is the Fort Meigs Association that does a great job um, interpreting the Fort Meigs site. It's another beautiful place to walk and visit um, to learn the history but also a great place to be out of doors. Um, I don't know if any of the members here are part of the Fort Meigs Association. I hope you, if you're a member of any of our partner organizations, please speak up in the chat um, because the supporting um, the Ohio History Connection helps support our sites, but joining and supporting our management partners is also a really great way to bolster um, the, the support of our sites as well. Um, down the road in Wapakoneta is the Armstrong Air and Space Museum. Our partner there is the Armstrong Air and Space Museum Association. And when Neil Armstrong was on the moon, uh, Governor Rhodes decided that there would be a museum um, in his hometown devoted to, to him and to space travel. And when the museum opened uh, in the 1970s, it opened before the National Air and Space Museum and there, was, um, and there was a moon rock on display there. And so it became very popular very quickly because of this opportunity to see a moon rock in person, which you can still do. Um, fort Amanda is um, not too far away. It is one of a series of forts that extend north um, from Piqua up, up to Fort Meigs um, and uh, built by the order of General William Henry Harrison. Um, and uh, it, it, it's a memorial site where the fort um, was. It's managed by the Johnny Appleseed Metropolitan Park District um, and is a, a lovely park and walk and it includes um, a cemetery there as well. Um, fort Recovery, um, which is also in the chain of forts um, on, the, on the west side of Ohio. It is managed by the Fort Recovery Historical Society and Fort Recovery um, is important in the confluence of European and American Indian history. There was a major, the largest defeat of the American uh, army takes place, um, the Battle of the Wabash. And also the events there lead to the Treaty of Greenville, which set up property rights in Ohio, but it also sets up sovereignty for American Indian tribes. So in addition to our sites in Northwest Ohio, um, we, are, we wanted to share with you just a little bit about the um, Hopewell Ceremonial Earthworks um, World Heritage nomination. And uh, this is something that is coming very soon um, for Ohio. And the World Heritage is a list of over a thousand sites across the globe that are um, understood to be so important that they should be considered part of humankind's common heritage. So World Heritage is a designation, it's a status that is conveyed um, by UNESCO. 
And there are over a thousand in the world and 24 in the United States, but none of them are in Ohio yet. There are um, three Ohio History Connection sites, along with five sites um, at Hopewell Culture National Historical Park in Chillicothe that are being prepared to be nominated to the World Heritage List by the United States Department of Interior. And on this slide, you can see the map of where those sites are located um, throughout Ohio, um, Newark Earthworks, Fort Ancient, um, and then which are Ohio History Connection sites, and then the grouping um, of National Park Service sites um, near and around Chillicothe. And uh, the, they include um, Hopewell earthworks that are uh, dated AD 1 to 400. Um, there are geometric earthworks and enclosures, but the sites also include um, a hilltop enclosure, which we have several examples of these in Ohio, um, including one of our sites, Fort Hill, but Fort Ancient is the site that is part of this nomination, which has uh, 3.5 miles um, of earthen walls. It's not actually a fort, but that was the name that um, was, were given to these types of enclosures um, during uh, European contact. So to be listed on the World Heritage List, UNESCO provides um, 10 criteria and requires that a site meet one of them to qualify for World Heritage. And the Hopewell Ceremonial Earthworks meets two of these. Um, masterpieces of human creative genius and unique or exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition or civilization which is living or has disappeared. So to that first um, criteria that we're meeting, uh, that we're laying out with these sites is the masterpieces of human creative genius. And um, what you see here in this slide is the astronomical um, alignments of the earthworks at Newark. This is um, the octagon uh, in Newark. And this is a complex uh, arrows and points, but are showing how the octagon, how the earthworks document um, in massive architecture, earthen architecture, um, the the moon rise, which is an, uh, an 18 and a half year cycle of the northern and southernmost um, moon rise. And so the amount of um, understanding of, um, of the phases of the moon and of that 18 year cycle, 18 and a half year cycle, plus the ability to create this perfect geometrical earthwork is, um, is the reason that we're using this as one of the criteria. And then also as an exceptional testimony to a cultural um, tradition. In fact, the artif artifacts um, made of beautiful materials um, from 100 miles away have been discovered within the Hopewell earthworks. The copper that, you, that comes from the earthworks is from the Northern Great Lakes. The obsidian is from Yellowstone National Park. The shells come from the Gulf Coast and the mica from North Carolina. Um, scholars, including our own um, senior archaeology curator, Brad Lepper, hypothesized that people came from, um, from very far away to these earthworks in Ohio as possi possibly a type of pilgrimage and brought these items with them as an offering. Um, they're not, we know that most of these objects are not day-to-day -day objects, but are very specially made, seem to be specially made for the purpose of being placed in the earth, often with burials at these sites. Um, so that this isn't necessarily a trade network as much as it is a coming together in, in this special place and bringing items um, to Ohio or what we now call Ohio. So why, you know, why are we going for world heritage? This is a, you know, a process that we're putting time and resources towards, um, but we see that this will be of great cultural and economic benefit um, to Ohio. That there, it brings world heritage brings um, travelers. It brings attention and focus, um, and it's also an opportunity to highlight um, our amazing American Indi Indian history, um, and also a way to reconnect um, with tribal nations and indigenous people around the world 
um, to these sites that were created um, by their ancestors. Um, so that was a whirlwind tour of our site system of um, World Heritage. Um, and I wanna thank um, my colleague, Jen Altman, who's not here with us today, but who has been leading these efforts. And as I said before, um, you know, there's many ways to support our sites. Um, you can visit them, you can be a member of the Ohio History Connection, or you can connect with their management organizations as well, um, who are doing the great work of um, operating our sites on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, during the pandemic, if you go to ohiohistory.org slash join, we have a site's hardship relief fund where we've been providing additional funding to our site management partners during this time of hardship when many have closed or partially closed. And um, you know the downturn that we've seen, especially in, in school groups being unable to visit our sites. Um, so uh, I will drop my email address in the chat because I'm happy to connect with anyone who wants to know how they can get more involved or would like more information. Um, but thank you so much for um, having us here today. Thank you, Megan and Bert. Um, now we're going to turn it over to club members. If anyone has any questions for Megan and Bert, raise your hand, enter them in the chat. I'll do my best to call on everyone, but we got over 100 people. So I hope I see you with a hand up. Yes, you've all, you can go first. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Unmuted. There you go. <laughs> Terrific presentation. I mean, anything historical is just beyond imagination. Um, first question is, um, is, is this uh, lecture available online or, <clears throat> or in a book or <clears throat> so that one can show it to other people? And the, uh, either Megan or, or Bert. And uh, in this connection, I would like to recommend to everybody the incredible book of uh, David McAuliffe, The Pioneers, who, who um, uh, the people who started the state of Ohio. It's an incredible book. In response to your first question, uh, much of this information that we've shared with you is available at our website, uh, ohiohistory.org. Um, but I think um, in many ways, there's no substitute for actually getting out and visiting uh, the sites that, uh, in Northwest Ohio that Megan mentioned um, and um, becoming involved in the many ways that we uh, actively work to promote and preserve local history across the state. Thank you. Bert and I are always up for future gigs. You just contact our agent. <laughs> All right, any other questions for Bert and Megan? Yep, Greg, go right ahead. Am I unmuted? Yep, you're good to go. Excellent presentation, Bert and Megan. Thank you very much for joining our Rotary meeting. I'm speaking on behalf of myself anyway, I really appreciate your coming. Um, my family goes back uh, many generations uh, prior to the Civil War in Ohio. Uh, one of them managed to get himself off the farm and get elected uh, United States Senator. It was Simeon D. Fess of Ohio. Um, he was also a, pro a history professor at uh, University of Chicago. Um, then his son, my grandfather, Lurfess, was the president of the Ohio Historical Society uh, in the late 50s and early 60s and uh, a, a trustee of the, of the board. Um, and it, it, with a lady by the name of uh, Marge Block, um, he, my grandfather was the uh, co-chair of the Lucas County Sesquicentennial Celebration, which would have been, I think, 1953. And my dad sort of took up the, the reins, and he was the co-chair, you know, actually the chair of the Perrysburg sesquicentennial celebration, which would have been 1966. So my question is, and I should say that those events kind of 
had an effect on me and a lot of citizens. You know, a celebration of Ohio, if you will, and or towns. Uh, so this isn't com a completely self-congratulatory uh, statement on my, half, my behalf to get people to understand where I fit in Ohio history. I would like to know, do we have any events coming up, any uh, celebratory Ohio events, or, or would the next one be the 253rd uh, celebration for us, name of which I don't even know as one? I, so I know that um, nationwide, everyone's gearing up for the semi-quincentennial of the United States. Um, and uh, we just recently passed the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, uh, the Women's Suffrage Amendment. And because so much of that got put on the um, things, so many things were planned for August of 2020, we're pushing those celebrations um, into... 2021, hopefully. Um, the same for the 100th anniversary of Warren Harding being elected uh, president. Um, and there's a new presidential center that we um, built at that site in Marion. That's part of our site network as well. Um, and I'll let Bert comment on other celebrations that are on the horizon. Well, uh, the fascinating thing about Ohio history is that it's so expansive. Uh, in uh, 2022, for example, will be the bicentennial of uh, Ulysses S. Grant's birth, so we'll be observing that. Uh, also, I believe it's in 2022, Megan, is the 250th anniversary of Sean Brunn uh, in Tuscarawas County. Uh, Sean Brunn was a Moravian settlement uh, and is one of the first contacts between uh, European settlement and the Delaware Indians at that time. Um, so hardly a year goes by uh, that there's not some centennial, uh, bicentennial uh, that we can point to across the state and really help not only that local area, but the state as well understand our rich um, heritage. Thanks, Bert. Uh, Megan, I think there's a couple questions in the chat from John Wasserman. Bob Savage and Tim Ryan, um, perhaps you can address those because we got one more minute left and I know Gary Johnson had his hand up, so I'm gonna call on him for one last question. I was just curious, Megan, and, and uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the other person's name, but the caves in uh, on South Bass Island and the monument, are they partnered with uh, the Ohio Historic Society or are they just because they're federal monuments, not part of that group? No, um, Perry's Monument is a National Park Service site, um, and we've definitely worked with the staff there before, um, especially during the uh, War of 1812 um, bicentennial uh, and those celebrations. So we, we work with pretty much any historical organization or our monument, but they're not um, under our purview. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of your questions. Um, I know Megan has her email in the chat if anyone would like to follow up with her. And now I believe I turn it over to President Alex. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bert and Megan, for a fantastic, interesting, and informative presentation. Um, for speaking to us today, we'll be sending you a well-known book in Toledo called The Historical Tales of Toledo, authored by Rotarian past president, Clint Mock. Uh, we'll also make a donation to the Polio Plus Fund in your name. Uh, thank you again. Um, and now for another episode of Chuck's Chuckles, here is past president, Chuck Mann. Chuck? Thank you, President Alex. Uh, in watching the forecast uh, and in knowing that in this morning's paper there was a picture that said that this was the anniversary of a very, uh, of the blizzard that hit Toledo, uh, I was reminded about uh, the time when one snowy, snowy night I got lost on the way home. Uh, I was just a teenager. The snow was blowing so fast and piling up so high I couldn't see any of the, of the street signs with no map, and it was way before the uh, advent of cell phones, 
I thought I might be stranded, so I pulled over to the side of the road. Then, breaking through the flurries, I saw the headlights of a plow truck in my rearview mirror. Thanking my lucky stars, I turned and followed the truck, hoping that it would lead me back somewhere I recognized. I followed that truck for what felt like hours. He'd turn left, I'd turn left. He'd brake to the right, I was right on his tail. After a while, I saw brake lights from the plow, followed by four-way flashers. Uh, the plow had stopped, and I saw the driver get out and approach my car. I rolled down the window to talk to him. Why are you following me, kid? The plow driver asked. Well, sir, my dad told me that if I was ever lost in a snowstorm, I should wait for a plow truck and then follow it. Well, the plow driver replied, we just finished clearing the Target parking lot. Want to follow me over to Best Buy? <laughs> President Alex. Oh, that's a beauty, Chuck. Thank you. Um, okay, so next meeting, February 1st, Bruce Kramer and Rick Helminski, Senior Consultants with Impact America, Crisis Management, Business Continuity, and Emergency Response Planning. Uh, we have two meetings immediately following today's meeting, and they are uh, one, our transformational project, Lead Abatement, and uh, the Peace Committee. So if you are uh, on, just stay on, and uh, we'll put you in the appropriate room. And I thank everybody for joining us today. Thanks again to Bert and Megan for a fantastic presentation. Have a great week, everybody. We're adjourned.